Welcome to the Yoga Podcast, keeping it real with your host, Claudia Azula Altucher. So hello and welcome to the Yoga Podcast. I am thrilled today to have Matthew Sweeney with me. Matthew is the director of the Yoga Shala Bali in Ubud. He is a yoga teacher, a Star Wars fan, and a twice black belt in martial arts. Matthew has explored and practices four or even five, I think, of the Ashtanga Yoga series of Patavi Joyce, who is the founder of Ashtanga Yoga, as well as the teachings of Krishnamacharya, Desikachar, BKS Iyengar, among many other teachers and trends of thought. He started teaching yoga in 1996, at first Ashtanga Yoga, but as he went on, he received thousands of students with unique challenges, and he developed his own sequences. He is the author of two books, Ashtanga Yoga As It Is and Vinyasa Krama, in which he explores the sequences. Too sorry, we may need to interrupt that because I think a couple of things are incorrect there. I might need to oh, re- oh, revisit. Please, please, please correct. Tell me. Okay. Oh, just the start, just because I, I'm, I'm not the director of the Shala Bali here with his three shareholders. So if the other shareholders heard that, they would probably be a bit upset <laughs> with me. <laughs> So maybe we re- restart that one. And the other one is, um, I have to remember this. I've just got to think about it. Uh, what year did I start? No, I started teaching in 1992. In 1992. Would you mind if we leave this like this? Because I think it's, it's, it's spontaneous and, and, and it's good. And yeah. then your partners hear how, how loyal you are, which is a great thing. <laughs> I'm sure. sorry about this, that I didn't have it right. No, no, it's, not a, it's not a problem. It's just, uh, you know. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, I understand. And it's good to know you started in 1992 then. I had that, I didn't get that right, so I'm glad you told me. Um, but I do know, yeah, and sure. this perhaps, um, you also have some DVDs uh, that can be downloaded with two sequences, Vinyasa Unlocked and the Moon Sequence. Is that right? And uh, many posters. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yes, and many posters of yeah, sequences. Well, yes. That are quite impressive. So I didn't quite get the bio right, but Matthew was here to help, which is a great thing. So Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming in. Uh, no, thanks for having me. So um, it's 6 p.m. there in Bali? Yes, that's right. And what did you do today? Oh, today uh, well, we rode, rode around looking for furniture and uh, uh, bits of t- uh, tables and chairs for a little uh, Indian dosa restaurant that we're we're starting to create nice is that together a little, with... a little indian restaurant called dosa corner very nice i love dosas yes i know so do i so i love south indian food so yeah we thought we there's not good south indian so much here in in bali so we thought we'd make a, a good little sort of yeah chai shop and and tiffin Oh, how nice. So this is in the, in the, this retreat where you're teaching, which you share, I guess, with other partners. And, uh, yeah. it looks amazing in the photographs. It looks really nice. Yeah. Overlooking rice fields. And, and, um, let me ask you, so, uh, what's the weather like there? Uh, well, hot and, hot and humid pretty much all year round. Though at the moment it's nice because it's raining almost every afternoon. So it cools off. That's good. And when, when was the last time you saw the snow? A long time ago. I think, I think the last time I really saw snow was probably in Germany in 1993 or 94. Yeah, because in all your pictures, you look like there's always sunshine around you. And, you yeah. know, you, you inspired me because I thought if I follow Matthew's teaching, I'll probably never see snow again, which... which no, but I mean, I, I have to say, like, we've actually I've been talking to my partner, Lauren, about this, and she really wants to have a white Christmas somewhere. So we'll probably go and do the snow one or two well not this christmas but maybe christmas after that oh okay well you know it's not not that i'm against the snow it's just that i i love i love warm weather weather. yeah me too (laughs) i like the snow i like the snow for one week of a year but that's all we're exactly the same and we have a northeastern coming in here in new york it's gonna start snowing anytime so it's it's a lot of fun and i have um i have some good news for you you're a big uh star wars fan and I understand right. this weekend the first trailer for the new movies is coming out. So uh, yeah, I heard some rumors of this. Um, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm very curious. Like I, you know, I love the first three movies. The, the the following three, they were okay. They just scratched the Star Wars funny bone. But um, yeah, we'll see what the next lot are like. And that's how you started into yoga, right? Martial arts and Star Wars. What was it about martial arts that got you uh, thinking along these lines? 
Oh well, I mean, I, I love, I guess, I love Bruce Lee and all of that kind of stuff, and I grew up wanting to be, I don't know, a Jedi master. Well, sort of, yeah, just you know, just wanting to be skillful and I don't know, wise at the same time, and eventually the whole self-defense thing fell to the side and became less important. And I don't know if I'm wise, but um, certainly. The, the interest is still there. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you are a wise man. Um, uh, for I mean, everything so. that comes across is, is really very... Your point of view, your way of looking at yoga is very, very interesting. I like how you keep it very down to earth, very real. Ah, okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's, that, that makes it very approachable, and um, I, I really like this. So you went to Patavi Joyce um, in 94 after having some martial arts training. And if, if I understand this, he actually opened the door of your rickshaw driver and uh, told you where to stay right, right away. He... Yeah, well, I, I, I rocked up there at a particular time of the day when he was often just, whatever, hanging out in the lounge room. And so my rickshaw stopped, and he just came out the front door and said hello and spoke in Canada to the rickshaw driver and spoke to me and whatever. I just had a very he, – he liked me. I liked him. We had a very good connection. And then he, I, he said, did you have a place to stay? I said, no, Guruji, I just arrived off, off the plane. And he said, oh, okay. And then he told in Canada the rickshaw driver where to go where all the yoga students were staying. So he found me my first hotel. <laughs> that's really nice. I mean, that's kind of that's like sweet. a dream for all of us now going to visit Mysore because it's so overcrowded now. And, uh, it's yeah, a- yeah. Completely yeah, well, first time I was there, there were, on that first day, uh, I think 16, 17 students. Wow. wow. But I was I was there in, I think it was in September, which was not a very high season time. And then by, I think by November, no, by December, um, I stayed there for six months, you know. So by December and January, there were a lot more people. But then it was, 50 people was crowded. Wow. That's amazing. Now it's like, 300. <laughs> yes, it's very, very, very crowded. And um, so you stay there for three years. You went for six months at the time. You really dedicated yes. yourself to um, Patavi Joyce and the asana portion, the, the poses of the yes, practice. Yes, me and my credit card did well. Ah. <laughs> did you get in debt? Oh, yes, very much. Oh, and then I would go home and pay it off and then come back and do it again. Yeah, that, that's the, the way of the yogi, isn't it? Trying to... <laughs> well, yeah, well, having two credit credit cards helped. But, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it also made for a few sleepless nights on the last couple of months. Mm, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it can do that. And um, you, did you also meet BKS Iyengar, Desika Char? Um... Um, yes, I've met both, both of them. I met actually BKS Iyengar in um, 1992 when I just started doing Ashtanga at a big conference he did in Sydney. So um, you took some classes with him or just that? It was no, it, I just no. attended the conference and watched some of his advanced students do his demonstration and so on. Okay. Um, to, to, to be honest about it, that was what made me want to go to Mysore instead. <laughs> oh, I see. It wasn't bad. It was a lovely, because I was really into Iyenga yoga, you see. So, But um, I, did, I just decided I, I wanted to pursue the Ashtanga thing. So I went to Mysore rather than going to Pune. Yeah, and just for the sake of people listening, some of them may not be so familiar with the difference between Iyengar and Patavi Joyce, but um, I, I guess the Ashtanga yoga is a lot more um, demanding physically, would you say, like in the jump backs, jump throughs, and never stops, while Iyengar is a bit more steady in each pose. That's right. I, you know, Ashtanga, first of all, has movement as its base, whereas Iyengar is much more static. Um, and uh, physically, Ashtanga is much more rigorous. Though Iyengar can be, if once you're allowed to do some of the advanced postures, it just can take a long time before any of the high up Iyengar teachers will let you do them. So, um, but yeah, Iyengar is a lot more structured. You know? Right. Yeah, and it takes so, longer to it takes a long time. Whereas Patavi Joyce, you would go to Ashtanga and you start with the primary series, which has all these very difficult poses, and you're thrown into the the soup of asanas, and and you have yeah, to that, swim or sink. Right. And there's you know there's advantages to that, um, but obviously some disadvantages too. So, mm. did uh, you get to meet Krishna Macharya? The uh, sort of like oh the, no no he was he, no he he passed before I had yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, it would have been nice, though. You know, I've had discussions with friends who are also into Krishnamacharya's teachings, and a few of us agree that 
we, we like the idea of doing classes with him, but if we'd met him in his younger days, we, we might not have liked it so much because he was pretty a pretty fierce man. Yeah. yeah, and so to Krishna, show the report. Okay. Yeah, that's how, that's what we hear. And so Krishna Macharya was actually the teacher of both Iyengar and Patavi Joyce and the Sikachar, who is his son. Um, but you have read, you're widely read, you also looked into um, therapy, ways of uh, sort of dealing with the mind, the gestalt um, way of thinking for whatever. So you're very much into how you can integrate your whole life from any um theory or, or way of looking way at of, it with the mind well yeah so i mean i guess um i would take the approach that that anything is probably useful it's just a matter of degree and and i just think whether you start with asana and then go towards a meditation or a psychotherapeutic practice or, or start with one of the others and then hit into i think sooner or later if you want to look at most of the pieces of the puzzle then you, you'll have to if you're going to be honest, you'll have to sort of look and and work on each of those pieces. Um, you know, I don't happen to believe that, let's say, just doing asana is enough to say that, therefore, it indicates a greater spiritual purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the same can be said of meditation or any practice. It's just a matter of being, let's say, being inclusive rather than being exclusive. And I just think there's an unfortunate tendency of the human mind to be a little exclusive and with any system that exclusivity is typically an error mm -hmm. and so it's just a matter of how honest how honest can you be if you're going to be dedicated to ashtanga yeah is, is that is that serving or is that just another addiction right right, right. what would you what would you say is your definition of yoga today um, uh, that's a, my definition of yoga today, well, my personal definition is um, uh, whatever you're experiencing here and now. And that's very interesting. It's very new, I, I think. It's, it's well, I don't know. I think it's a very old philosophy. It's just, it's, it's just new if you've never heard it before. <laughs> yeah, I, but I think it's coming more and more into the front of thinking of yoga in terms of the here and now, rather than it being uh, either a tradition or the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind or bringing it back to what's real here. Right. And so, you know, whether it's through asana or a breathing practice or a meditation practice or whatever you choose to focus on, um, you know, the question is, is that helping you to be here and now or is it a projection of I'm doing this technique to get to some other better place? And if you're practicing a technique like this, well, it's not really yoga by definition because a technique by its nature indicates past, present and future. And thus, any technique, if you're dedicated to it, is not yoga, right. which is right. a frustrating point to wrestle with because then anyone who's doing a technique is therefore not doing yoga. Yes, and you then, know, from that, from a certain perspective, it doesn't mean you're not doing yoga. It's just uh, how you see it. Yeah, um, I, I recently had an opportunity to talk to Tony Robbins through another interview, and he oh, had yeah. a martial arts teacher. And one right. one night he was practicing, and he said, "Teacher, when am, when are we going to do the next pose?" Because he had been yeah. practicing the same pose for three hundred times, which resonated with me, especially in the Ashtanga Yoga world. Yeah. And the the teacher yeah. said to him, "This is the next pose." And the fact yeah. that you can't tell the difference between how you did it before and now, and it blew my mind because uh, when you think about it, this is the next pose all the time, then you can somehow return <laughs> to this moment rather than the right. ideas we have. Yeah. I really like what you say that um, Krishnamacharya said that the bandhas are not something we do, but a blockage to be removed. Uh, yes. And especially in your last book, you talk about, and I, I guess we need to give the audience a basic definition of what a banda is. What would you say? Oh, well, this is, this is a question that I often ask students, like, because there's a lot of mm, teachers talking about banda these days, and I'm one of them. Um, I just think my perspective on it, at least so far, seems to be a little different than the standard asana you want. Um, and so... I mean, the three bandhas to me are the parallel between the three layers of the self or the three layers of the body, if you want. Um, and so that would be gross, subtle and causal. Mm. And if you're going to look at the three bandhas purely on a physiological level, 
uh, I tend to doubt the purpose of that. Uh, you know, I tend to be a little, let's say, sceptical. Whereas if we're looking at it in terms of the gross, subtle and causal layers of who we are as a human being, um, then if you're going to talk about Mulabandi, you've got to talk about, well, what is the gross layer? And so, okay, working on the perineal body or the cervix for women, you know, et cetera. Uh, look, I do a lot of lectures on this and we could have a, a at least a, probably a six-hour discussion on this subject alone. So just to try and put it into a small piece, then I would say the only way that I would personally recognise Mulabandi in myself or in another person if I'm able to is um, the resolution of any issues you have dealing with your body. Right. And you so put it's, it... In... It's irrespective of any sensation you might feel or any ability you have with jump-throughs and jump-backs. That's kind of irrelevant. Um, whereas, I'll put it this way, my definition, my current definition of Mulabanda, here it goes. <laughs> um, when you are in a complete loving relationship with your body 24-7. That's a great way to put it. And, and so if anything else exists for you, like an image of your body that you don't like or if you don't like how you did a posture or anything that's not loving, it's therefore you're not in Mulabanda yet. So you haven't resolved your issues with your body yet. That's very interesting. That's a completely different way of looking at it. I love it. And you also said um, in your last book is when you resolve issues with um, money as well and with sex as well as food. Um, it's kind of like... Okay, the... so, well, all right, so there's different ways to look at these different layers. If we're looking at the lower layers, mostly I would talk about the body and the sexual body dealing with the lower bundle. I see. Okay, so how you are in your physical being and, and sexually, physically sexually. And so, yeah, if, you, if you're not resolved and in right relationship sexually, Mulabanda is not active. No matter how much you feel those sensations up and down, it's irrelevant in the end. It's just a sensation. And they're wonderful, interesting, but it doesn't mean that the actual reality of this blockage is, is unblocked. And so at, uh, with the next couple of chakra or energy levels, if you want, then dealing with, you know, the sort of solar plexus and heart, Solar plexus would be relating to money. So it's a, money's are like a, a value system. It's a, a way of putting value on different things. So any kind of issues with money is, is relating to this middle body issues or in fact, Uddiyana Bandha. Oh, so Uddiyana Bandha is functioning when you have a healthy relationship to money. And a healthy relationship to money is one where you don't sort of fear it, you, you're not averse to it, and at the same, you're not uh, like. Yeah, you don't reject it. You don't, you don't reject it. You don't crave it. Right. You're fairly, you know, you, you know, because people they say, oh, you know, money doesn't make you happy. But, you know, if you've got a hundred thousand dollars in your bank from a, some gift, you'll have some interesting, pleasant sensations floating right. your body in that month. <laughs> they, they will go away pretty quickly, though. It's like a high oh, that sure. you'll get. But the fact is, it's energy and energy when it's like that is, you know, and so how you deal. It's not whether you have that energy. You know, it's not about how much money you have. It's just how you deal with it. Right. So this, this is it's not it's not what asanas you can do or, or how good looking you are. It's just what you do with it, how you deal with it. Right. Right. And so the higher bandha, then the Chalandara bandha, the, the net in the stream, would be your relationship to consciousness, to thinking, to dealing with your relationship to your own mind, to consciousness, and the relationship you have to God. I see. I see. So, so, so the loving that you were talking about in the first time, it sort of integrates all three like when, when you're well. Well, that's right. It's a loving relationship to your body, a loving relationship to human beings and, and, and the other beings on the planet, and, and a loving relationship to consciousness, to space, and to if you believe in God or not, but believing, let's say, higher consciousness. So a loving relationship to that aspect of, of the universe. And I think that's a good way to say, because many people sort of, um, uh, there is a tendency from, say, the unchecked mind to judge, oh, that is a good yoga teacher or not, whether they can do amazing postures. But really, and I think you say this in your book, is about how kind can you be with another person is, is more of a reflection. Well, it's more about our relationships, our relationships that we have to ourselves and to others that, that reflect a good yoga practice. 
So uh, we had a little technical difficulty there, but, but we're back. And um, I, I think you were talking about being kind is really the, the important thing. Well, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, there's different levels of kindness because, of course, it has to be authentic. Right. Um, and if you, can't, if you can't be kind, then at least compassionate. That's right, yes. Right, because sometimes kindness may not always be appropriate, appropriate so we can... You know, sometimes we have to say no or we or, you know, a certain amount of anger may be fairly natural and under certain circumstances. Um, so saying no is appropriate. So um, but, uh, yeah, if not kindness, then compassion. Right. Yes. And that comes straight from the Yoga Sutras, by the way. And it's true. Sometimes you can be kind because when someone is really mean to you, that's very, very difficult. At least. Well, um, right. And it, it may not be appropriate because if someone is being, uh, uh, no, I don't know, extreme situation, violent or uh, abusive, then being being kind in a certain way may not be appropriate because it, it is, it's as though you're giving that person permission to be more abusive. Exactly. So, you know. A strong no may be, may be the answer, but then, of course, you practice compassion instead and say, oh, well, this person, poor person, is, is being misguided. Um, right. And so, you know, it's yeah, not, not altogether uncommon in most yeah, of our experience. It's nice. And you have a daughter, uh, Matthew? Yes, Hello? my daughter just turned 16. Really? Oh, goodness. Yes, she's a, she's a, oh, she's a lovely 16-year-old, but she's, a, you know, she's, a, she's almost six foot tall and... Oh wow! Quite, <laughs> quite the teenager. Is is it? Does she think you're cool, or are you totally uncool now? Uh yeah, no. I think I passed out of being cool about three years ago. So <laughs> I'm not. I'm not uncool because I go to very cool places for travel. I see. And so that part of my life is really cool. But some of the things I talk about are very uncool. Oh, I see. <laughs> Um, you know, and I'm not very up to date with modern music, so I do like some of it. But yeah, yeah yes, I'm not really cool that way either. <laughs> I have a 15 year old stepdaughter, so I, I, oh, okay. I think we're going through the same thing. It's a very interesting age for for kids. Does she do yoga? No, she she's into surfing. In fact, so she's she's actually come here to do schooling here at the international school in uh, called the Green School. Um, and so, but yeah, in spare time, she's she's gonna. We're, we're doing our best to get her down and go surfing all the time. That's good. Surfing is. A, I hear there is a lot of connection between surfing and yoga. Maybe later on in life, who knows? Who knows what may happen? <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. So, Matthew, you know, I remember my first trip to Mysore was 2008. Yours was 1994. So we're in Mysore, and uh, I'm with my friend Martina. There is an electric cat, of course. So we're by candlelight, and we have your book, Ashtanga Yoga, as it is. And we're with huh. the candle, we're looking at each of the poses. And I think we got to Marichasana H, or one of those where you're in a twist, and at the same time you have a leg behind uh, your head. And we would look at sure. each other, and we would go, no, that's, that's impossible. There is no way, there is no way. And, and that happened for hours. We would be sort of like hypnotized by your book. And the, the, this, this book, did it come organically by you? Did you just sort of made this first and then you wrote some more about it or did you plan it? Oh, no, I'm not much of a pre-planner with that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess it, the, the inspiration was actually sparked by Dharma Mitra's poster. I don't know if you've seen that, the one oh, with, yeah. you know, a, a thousand asanas all in a row. And so I originally thought, oh, it would be really good to see the primary series as a poster so you see everything in a row with all the vinyasa and postures. So, you know, it's just all on one piece. Mm. And so once I designed the poster, I took a bunch of photos, et cetera, with a you know, friend photographer. And um, so then I just thought, well, it's also nice as a booklet because not everyone can put a poster on a wall somewhere. And so I did it as a booklet. And then some years after that, you know, students were – telling me, oh, why don't you put some of the things that you teach in classes into the book, some of the, the dialogues and satsangs that I used to do. And um, at the time, I, you know, I was still quite young and I was a bit shy about that. But, you know, over time I thought, oh, well, I guess I've got something to offer there. And, yeah, the book slowly came out. So the original idea was just pictures. I thought that can't offend too many people because, you know, it's yeah. just pictures postures. So. Yeah, you have yeah. to be careful what you put out there. But it's very interesting that you have uh, sort of like all the transitions – within the primary series for any Ashtanga student. So you can see it's a great book, really. You have 
uh, how you do the back bends and the drop backs at the end and all of the series and uh, the transitions. It's a really, really good book and I've seen it everywhere. So I, I would say it's possibly a bestseller. You can now even download it from your site, which is really good. Yeah. Yeah, well, it seems to be well liked. You know, I see a lot of people running around with their photocopied version of it too. So it's oh, <laughs> it's really? A oh. Of as well. <laughs> that's not a hint to anyone listening to this, by the way. <laughs> no, I, I know, but that's interesting. Yeah, I, I guess people love it so much they can't help it sometimes. Yeah, look, it's all right. These things happen. <laughs> Um, I, I've been looking in your website at your teacher training, your sort of your teaching around the world and then how you train teachers. And uh, it's a very elaborate process. For example, if I wanted to... <laughs> it seems that way, yeah. <laughs> if I wanted to attend your teacher training, you have this thing about getting to know the student first. Um, yeah. So what was the thinking behind that? Okay, well, this is my big beef on most modern teacher training and... It comes in two parts, I guess, but the main, the first part is I would consider, you know, I have nothing personally against other teacher training, but my issue is with most head teachers, if they're going to run teacher training for us in a teacher training, let's call it, mm -hmm. um, you know, you should get to know the student first. Mm -hmm. And, and if you, if you don't get to know the student first, it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it's particularly, I don't know if I can call it unethical, but let's say not very smart. So, you know, whereas if I do get to know a student first, and there's some students who ask, and I say, look, I think you need to practice for a couple more years. Or, in fact, most of the students who are asking me, actually, I tend to get along well with. But occasionally I meet someone who wants to do it. I'm like, look, we, we just, we're not going to gel. Mm. So I won't do it if there's, if there's a big personality clash. That's a very that's different way of looking at it. That's part of my at... gestalt training too, I guess, in that it's not that I would dismiss someone who I have issues with or who I struggle to teach, but if, if I feel fundamentally we don't have a good connection, then there's no point doing teacher training. Right, right. And so you have, for example, you, you get to know someone that they come to a one-month uh, period of yeah, just they, yes. practice. Yeah, so these are my main courses that I run around, well, not even around the world anymore. Mostly I'm just doing them from uh, Bali and India. So I run these one-month courses. People come as students, so they learn both Ashtanga and, and some of the other alternative sequencing that I teach. And through that process, as they're learning the different sequences, then naturally some students want to do the teacher training, and so then they fit in either one year or the year after. And, and during that time, they practice, they email me, and so there's an ongoing relationship. So I, I insist on people, if they don't know how, but learning how to communicate, both via email, by phone, and, and in person. And so this is a part of the training process for any good teacher is, well, but you don't, not all of us, and I mean, certainly I wasn't, are, are naturally good communicators. Right. And so right. it's a process of learning, well, how do I go about communicating, particularly with students who may be a bit difficult? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a very so important I want, point. I want, I want my students to actually communicate with me. Right. And when someone comes to one of your, uh, say, one-month intensive, it, is, it doesn't have to necessarily be Ashtanga yoga that they're practicing, right? No, though it is, it is a basis. And usually for most students it's, it's at least 50% of it, but for some students it's less, and for some students it's a bit more. It just depends on you know, what, what students want to learn, but also what their body's capable and willing. <laughs> and so for me, it's, again, just a practical thing in terms of, um, you know, what sequencing seems to be appropriate, how old someone is, you know, what they're going through, what their current state of health is. Right. And so then, you know, some students will be learning more moon sequence and other of my personal sequences or... Or, or even within the primary series, it's like, well, jumps aren't quite appropriate because someone's got a shoulder injury. So we, we implement other vinyasa without missing the primary series too much so that they can still keep up a, you know, steady practice. Right. The moon sequence is something you developed personally and, um, is, is more of a, I mean, the, the Ashtanga Yoga primary series, which is how many of us g got introduced to practicing every day and, and building the ritual and yep. all of that is very yep. uh, intense. There is a lot of right. let's get, let's do this. You have to really breathe deeply and get in the mood and, and, and do it. Right. So um, I've recently been exposed to the moon sequence for the first time. And uh, I'm, I'm actually very glad to have an, an alternative that's 
what would you say is the effect of the moon sequence? Well, it's, it, it crosses the fence between what's called a yin yoga practice, so something that is more passive and not exertive and about releasing in postures rather than activating. And so the moon sequence heads more in that direction towards, even though we're doing vinyasa, which is a little bit active, but heading towards not over-efforting, not, not trying so hard, not being so rajasic. And despite the at an advanced level, some advanced practitioners can start to integrate a more sattvic practice. The tendency is, in 99% of Ashtanga practice, practitioners, the tendency towards a more rajasic style during the practice. And the only time the sattvic element comes into play is during Shavasana. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, that, that's not entirely true. Like, you know, there are certain elements within, like, the breathing at the end or headstand, et cetera. But still the majority of the physical vinyasa is, is rajasic. And by rajasic, um, you mean... Uh, um, uh, you know, fiery, more, more, more outward, more physical-based energy. Right, right. And, and when you say um, sad... It's not to say that rajasic energy is wrong. It's just that, that there's a tendency for that in the Ashtanga practice. This is partly the reason why yin yoga came into being, was to, to, to make some attempt to balance that. And wouldn't you say in the world in general, we're a little bit rajasic or like, go get it and... Well, and... I, no, I don't know. Yeah, there is that, that, that tendency, but then there's an uh, alternative tendency. People are rajasic and then they come home and they watch TV and are very tamasic. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, you know, the more rajasic you are, there's going to be a tamasic element somewhere that's, that's counterbalancing it. And the problem is we flip between those two without trying to find some integration of the two. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. So, so for example, integrating a more receptive and releasing routine to the practice would have a very a good balancing effect. Um, right. Looking I mean, toward... the, other effect, the other effect of the moon sequence that's critical is, is that the fact is, um, even within the Ashtanga community, is around 80% of practitioners are women. Right, and right. Both the reference point of Mulabandha tends to be taught from the masculine point of view, uh, you know, the perineal body rather than the cervix. And men don't have a cervix, women do, right. etc. And the, the element of the practice, which is more upper body focused, um, so it tends to be more masculine in its energy. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. thus, a lot of advanced female practitioners start looking a little bit masculine. Right, right, yes. And it's, and it's, it's an issue, uh, including things like you're developing... Uh, if you're skinnier, it's easier to do a lot of the practice, you know. So there's a lot of psychological conditions that, that Ashtanga tends to make, uh, if not if not better, at least, they, you know, well, it can make some of these conditions worse, let's be honest. Right, right. right. So, um, And I think it's important for me as a female practitioner, it was hard to let go of this idea that I want to get to fourth series, you know. I had that yeah, going. Right for a long time and uh, eventually realized that, I mean, I'm 46 now, so I realized some yep. postures will never happen for me and to be okay with that. Right. And, and, and that's, that's good whether you practice Ashtanga or not. And I think that's just a healthy part of the process to realize, okay, some of this won't be accessible for me. Um, and then it's just a matter of seeing, well, how much of the practice is working for me and uh, is there some part of it that's not? Right. And often enough, the answer is over time, oh, there's some of it doesn't work for me. Yes. And that's what I love about your teachings is that you say, you know, we, we do have a tradition. We do have, there is, a, um, you know, a, a sort of a suggested guideline, but it all comes right. down to what's happening here and now as we step on the mat today. Right. No, so to insist on a student, okay, it's devotional to do the primary series, how it's said, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the question is, well, if that's not practically useful, then the devotion starts falling out of the window when, when someone's in chronic pain and being pushed into a sequence that in the end simply physically doesn't suit them. Right. And it doesn't matter how devotional you pretend to be in that place, it's, it starts to be violent. Um, and so, you know, some compassion needs to be there for, like anyone with an injury. I mean, no sane teacher after, I mean, I've, I've seen this happen, you know, so it's a sad story, but student getting, getting pushed into Marichyasana D, one meniscus pops. Um, mm. Slowly it starts to heal a little bit, though it doesn't get better, it's just manageable, and then continues to get pushed in Marichyasana D, and then the other meniscus pops. 
Yes, and Mary Chastanadi is a very complicated posture by which one yeah, leg is so in half lotus, and then you're twisting. Being worked on opening the hips, so you right. know the inevitable happened. Yeah, and so you know, and this is not not an isolated situation in in the Ashtanga community anyway. Right. So it's, it's kind of the problem is with a lot of those students who have been injured, you never hear about them again because they stop practicing. And that's sad. Yeah, very sad. Yes. Yeah. So, yes, bringing it back to, to this moment, that's the important thing. Like, if there is a takeaway from, from anyone who's listening, I, I, including myself, is to remember to respect uh, the body where it's at today and to work with what we right. have uh, so that it's right. real yoga. Well, um, exactly. And that's, and that's both the teacher's and the student's responsibility to be, okay, for the teacher looking at the student, what's happening for this student now, not what should be happening because that's the teacher's desire for the student to get better, which is a mistake right from beginning and end. It's just a, a terrible thing that teachers get into. I've made this mistake myself, and I'm, I probably will make it again. It's the desire to see the student improve. Right. And that right. desire is false. It's, it's something to be, to be gotten rid of. Whereas looking at the student and going, ah, this is where they're at now, and if there's tears streaming down the face, you might want to address that. Right, <laughs> right. Or, or if there's... You know, frowning or grunting or harsh breathing. It's like, oh, what's happening now? You know, and so then we can address moment by moment what's appropriate. That's right. Yes. And um, moving on to the the breathing uh, part of uh, yoga, the fourth limb of yoga or pranayama. Um, how did that come to you? When did it come to you? Did you study with a teacher, or how did that happen for you? Yeah. Well. Uh... I mean, I've done some pranayama with Patabi Joyce. I've done pranayama with a few other teachers, my anger teacher and a couple of others, even uh, Clive Sheridan. Um, so, I, I'm, strangely enough, like I've, let's say for the first 10 years or more that I was practicing, I was more interested in asana and then from there more interested in meditation. Mm -hmm. So pranayama took a bit of a back seat to, to both of those. I do my pranayama within the practice, but not, not so much outside of it. Mm. Um, but in the last, I guess, five, six years, I've been doing a little more pranayama practice independently. And I guess a lot of the stuff that I've learned from these teachers just started to formulate into its own system. So, yeah, now I've just in the last couple of years started to teach a bit of a pranayama system that I find is complementary with the sequencing of asana that I'm teaching. Mm. And so, yeah, it's a basically sequence of pranayama, and so it seems to work. It's practical. I like it. Um, not everyone wants to do it, so I don't teach it to everyone. <laughs> right, right. I, so it came in a very organic way to you. First, it was really just the asana, and then the, and all of the the surrounding, the yamas and yamas, and and and, and then it came to you. And and is that what yeah, you so talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Go on. Is, is, is this what you talk in the Vinyasa Krama book? Um, is, yeah, is that, is that... Right. and that's, I mean, I've, I mean, for me currently, I guess some of the material in that's a little bit out of date, but I, I'm not planning to produce more, I guess, more, um, more books on this subject simply because I rather teach pranayama in person and people keep coming to me. I, I teach the sequencing, um, but... Yeah, I'm not really interested in putting, I guess, too much of that in a book. So the, the, the stuff that I've got in Vinyasa Krama, I still teach, but uh, some of it is a little unrefined or out of date, let's say. I see, I see. And, and I like the idea of doing it more in person because it's so um, intricate and, and, and sort of like, it's, it's like refining the musician's training, you could say, if you were to make a parallel with music. It's very individual, I guess, Um Right. the deeper you get. No, and I just think a lot of it for me is if a student's really interested to learn the pranayama, I'll, I'll teach it. And if they continue to practice it, then I'll continue to teach the next part, much like asana. So right. I'm not going to start teaching a whole lot of variations on Nadi Shodhana pranayama if the student hasn't, isn't, isn't continuing to practice the prior stages, just as you don't get to do much intermediate unless you do primary for a while. Same kind of thing. Right, yes. One thing I like about your... And, so, and some people yeah. just aren't interested to learn it, so that's okay. I don't think it does bother me. But, you know, and some people want to learn pranayama very early, whereas for me, I, I, didn't really, I didn't really... I mean, I've been practicing it consistently for years, but I didn't really make a, an emphasis on it 
uh, really in, in my teaching of, of pranayama up until recently. So, you know, that's just how I've approached it. That's, you know, yeah, other I've teachers, seen... I think, you know, as I say, cause I'm a big fan of meditation. So I'm often telling students, if you're going to pick, I suggest meditate. But for some students, that's hard. And so you can use pranayama as a way to begin a meditation practice because it's a bit easier to focus on pranayama than just to meditate, for some people anyway. Right. I, I've been disliking that word meditation recently because of how many sort of how much misunderstanding goes into it. Um, so yeah. how, how do you understand meditation then? Well, well, you know, a, any moment and every moment is meditation, at least potentially. Um, but in terms of a practice, for me, it's, it's usually based on a silent sitting practice. Mm hmm. So, you know, it's, it's just uh, being still, sitting, and, and there's maybe a variation of techniques you can do in that or, or just sit and observe each moment, which is not really a technique. It's just a matter of experiencing moment by moment. I, I really like that. I, I actually prefer to, lately, I prefer to call meditation just sitting in silence, which I'm glad to right. hear you're here right. you're saying that too because it's, it keeps it real. It's, it's about observing what's happening and, and, and the loops that the mind can get you in and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, the technique, or if there is a technique, is usually just to practice a way to uh, either look at the mind or look at where the, the issues are arising. And so that very looking with a technique um, has both a positive and negative side to it. Mm -hmm. As I said, because the technique, any technique in the end is a potential blockage to reality right right yeah and it's not easy to see reality as it is the way we, we, well, we right we, yeah. so that's why we keep going back to the technique <laughs> yeah and that's why it's a, it's a practice too we we we, we attempt it every day uh, consciously in yoga right. yeah so you know i think the point is to practice a technique and then let go of it and then practice either the same technique or another technique and then let go of it right and the issues that come up are typically practicing a technique and then hanging on to it, you know. Mm. Just observing, so. observing what comes up, let it go. I think uh, Pema Chodron puts it, uh, letting go of the thinking, she says, and, and just staying with the feeling, but letting right. go of the words that, that go around, right. the storylines. Right. Yeah, it's what I call feeling consciousness rather than thinking consciousness. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah, feeling consciousness. What are you feeling? Is is at the at the at the root of it. I like that. Yeah. Right. Um, one of the yeah. things I like here just is to, uh -huh. just to yeah. say, you know, feeling consciousness can head us towards uh, what I would call observer consciousness. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, just the the observance the of space of of you know the the emptiness of that kind of con consciousness. Yes, we're going Emptiness deep here. Emptiness or spaciousness. Anyway, yes. Okay. <laughs> what were you going to ask? Um, I like how you say at the end, um, when you're talking about your teacher trainings that um, you don't register or certify anyone with the Yoga Alliance, but rather you certify by, by your own consciousness, you say. And um, I like that very much because there is this mythology out there that people are certified by the Yoga Alliance and that means something. But you take it really deep into um, our own moral compass and whether you're going to be a teacher or not depends on your own sort of participation and how ready you feel for it. Yeah, well, you know, in the end, the only thing that you need to start teaching yoga is to start teaching yoga. True. <laughs> or let's say asana, you know, all you have to do is start teaching asana. You don't need a certificate for that. But, you know, the certificate can give you a bit of confidence and maybe a few skills, hopefully, if you've done a training course. But um, most of the time, as a teacher, the only way you'll actually learn to be a good teacher is by teaching a lot. Yeah. And it takes a lot of energy. I've recently started teaching uh, regularly and I cannot believe how much energy it takes to verbalize what has to happen in another body. Uh, yeah. It's 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 a huge amount of energy. Yeah, well, you know, you as time goes on, you get to refine that. <laughs> I hope so, because at the moment I, I sweat tons just in teaching a class and a uh, 
Uh, I hope it will get easier. Um, uh, you know, it, it usually does, but that's part of the part of the part of the learning process. Like it's like going back to learning the beginning of your your asana sequence. It's like yeah, it's it's often a bit of a struggle to begin with. Yes, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't have to be, but it's it's it has elements of struggle to it. Right, right. until you find your footing, I suppose. Um, yeah, and just just finding a natural way, you know. Yes. Yes. So I want to ask you one question that I, I find very revealing. So it's, it's a little bit deep. So here it comes. Um, okay. Yeah. In, in your own uh, yoga path that has been pretty long, what would you say is one thing that took you a very long time to finally understand? I think there's a lot, oh, there's a lot of things I can answer to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the one that comes to mind is this one, and this is one I'm still working on, so I don't say that I've mastered this. Uh, people are more important than the practice. People in this moment and what is happening right here and right now. So, you know, at the end of, at the end of your life, at the end of your life when you're back, what you'll remember are the people that you, that you spend time with. You, you, my, my experience of, of talking to and reading about people with even near-death experiences They don't, they don't worry about what asana practice they did or how many years they meditated. Mm. That may have helped them in that moment of past. But, but mostly what people talk about is, is people. The friends, right. the lovers, the, 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 the children. Yes, the experiences. But, you know, who you shared your life with. That, I like that. Very nice, very nice. Yes, it's about and, and, the people. To put, it in, to put it another way, how you shared your life. And so if you spend most of your time obsessing about your practice, which is, you know, you're by and large, you're doing that on your own. Um, yeah, it's a bit of an isolated existence. Mm. And, and pointless and not, too. Not to say, you know, that's not worthwhile because we need time for that to be connected with ourselves, you know, connected with our body. Just as time in meditation can be connected to consciousness. This is important. But it's, but it's, it's only important next to how that goes into relationship with others. Yes. And so if my meditation practice has helped me to be loving to, to, to my partner and to the people around me, then, then, then it... I, I think that's very nice. And that, that's one thing that anyone listening can take with them. That, um, what are my relationships today? What, what's happening today? What, what am I, um, who do I cherish in my life? How, how can I help? How yeah. can I be kind? It's, it's a very sweet yes. way of looking at life. Um, yeah. Matthew, you are about to release three new DVDs? Um, well, two, in fact. But, yes, the, uh, the Stunga DVDs, um, primary and the primary series and the intermediate series. Um, there's another one that I may or may not release. So I'm, I'm not sure about that yet, which will be the Lion Sequence. It's the second of my sequences in the book, Vinyasa Krama. And that the, the Lion Sequence is the more active sequence? Yeah, it's sort of... Um, I guess the sequence lies partway between the moon sequence primary and the intermediate series. Mm -hmm. mm. It's Very got a lot of stuff in it that Ashtanga just doesn't have. So it's a, it's become one of my most cherished sequences because it works the body in a, you know, it's not as vigorous in a way than Ashtanga is, but it's still quite a powerful sequence. Mm -hmm. And that's one that your students don't get to learn in teacher training and, until the second level of, of, of teacher training. So it's a pretty, oh, I guess. Oh, that's, well, teacher training is a little different. It's just students who come and do usually at least one or two courses with me, uh -huh. usually, on the sec usually on the second course, um, they, they'll start learning this sequence. Oh. It just depends on, some students learn it on the first course. It just depends on their prior practice. You know? I see, I see, I see. So where can people find you if they're interested in coming to your beautiful place there in Bali on the rice fields? Amazing. Uh... <laughs> yes, it is lovely. Uh, well, our retreat center here in, uh, in Ubud, uh, in, on Sangingan Road and in uh, Penistanan. Um, I do courses here for two to three months a year, and I'm now mostly doing courses in India. I'm doing two months of courses in Rishikesh in India in February and March in 2016. And so we're looking into actually building a little property there for a nice retreat center also. Wow, very nice. Yeah. 
And and so, it, so I've got a number of Indian students, so uh, they're quite happy about that. <laughs> that's not, yeah, I bet they are. Um, and Ricochet is a very spiritual place. That's where Sivananda was, I believe. Yeah, it's, it's on the Ganga. It's on the Ganga, so Mother Ganga, so a very beautiful place. Um, yeah, lots of yoga and uh, lots of satsang. There's various gurus and workshops and teachers that come there. So students who come to the courses can also, you know, before or after go and do other other things with other teachers, which is quite nice. Yeah, and make a pilgrim or something. And on the web, you are yogatemple.com, right? That's right, yes. That That's wonderful. And you have, so um, in January of 2015, is that you're releasing these two new DVDs on the primary and the intermediate series of yes, Astanga? Yes, I hope to, though. Actually, yeah, I need to change the dates of that. I keep getting pushed back. But, yes, hopefully they'll be finished and ready for download in the, let's say, in the first half of next year. Okay, so the, by the latest, it should be June. It should be June. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. They, they, they might be. They might be ready by February or March. Okay, so this will release around the end of January, so people can probably start check yogatemple.com dot com and and see whether see where you're at. That's right. So thank you very much, Matthew, for coming on the podcast, and I hope okay, to meet you, you in Claudia. person. Yes, very soon. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hey, thanks for that. Bye. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. That's all for the Yoga Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in iTunes and visit theyogapodcast.com for more interviews. Until next time, keep it real.